Broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studios in Woodstock, Georgia, this is Woodstock Proud, spotlighting the individuals, businesses, and organizations that make Woodstock one of the premier destinations in Metro Atlanta to live, work, and play. Now, here's your host. Hello and welcome back once again to Woodstock Proud here on Business Radio X. I'm your host, Jim Bulger. We appreciate you coming back and spending some time with us as we celebrate and spotlight the individuals and the businesses that are making a difference here in the Woodstock community. So here we are. We're in the month of December, well into the holiday season. And you know, this time of year, you kind of regularly hear people say, If only we could harness, if only we could capture the feelings we have during the holidays, the kindness, the joy, the generosity, if only we could capture that and have that all year long. Well, our guest today is determined to do just that. Thomas Cantley is the CEO and founder of Stream Moco, a newly launched and very innovative streaming platform that focuses on positivity. Thomas? Welcome to Woodstock Proud. Pleasure to be here. Well, now, there's a lot I want us to talk about, but for those who aren't yet acquainted, and you've been everywhere, you're getting a lot of buzz right now, but for those who haven't heard about StreamMoco, let's start with just an overall description of the platform, what it is, and how it's different from what people may be used to seeing on Facebook or YouTube or Netflix or other platforms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so MoCo is two things that I'm super passionate about and love. is just this uh, positive content, feel-good content, inspirational content um, that we've curated. And it's all, it's, it's narrative, it's production quality, and it's all in one place. So it's a lot of stuff that are based on, you know, we're in this new generation of, of content creation and creators, like everyone can be a creator now, you know, and everyone has a story and, you know, if they have a really good camera, even an iPhone 13, they can create content, right? Absolutely. So for us, um, Netflix and Hulu, they have this standardized quality. It's just a, a different elevation of quality that isn't, it's, it's still, you know, it's just, it's a different level, you know, and it's a lot of its narrative. It's, it's really built out where us, we have authentic stories and authentic content by creators. So some of it you may find on YouTube and some of it is, 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 in, is been created exclusively for us. So, but it all has to have a similar mission of, uh, taking back some form of message feel good and and um it's all about like when you're watching it when you're taking away from it it can affect anyone negatively so our height not only just focusing on the quality of content and the narrative of episodic content it has to have a takeaway that isn't impactful negatively on anyone so when someone views these i mean obviously you want them to feel better Mm-hmm. about the world around them and themselves after they view this. But it, it has a contagious aspect to it, too, because when when someone walks away with those feelings, they're probably going to treat the people around them a little bit differently. Mm-hmm. And that positive outlook, that optimism is contagious, right? 100%, you know, and, and there's this, you know, we've talked before in these conversations, and it's just about positivity, you know, is a weird word, you know, and, and the holistic community they've originally we actually were called positive tv and then we had to switch it to moco because positive you know our our definition of positivity is more based off of mood how you feel that feeling of positive aspect is just that energy that you give off first the word of you know just positive like everything's just positive because then it just opens you up to you know just some negativity and just going okay you can only be positive that's the only way that you can do that so we just kind of pull back and we say it's about the feeling the feeling you feel of just hope happy is more of that so when you think positivity it's more about that emotion versus the word Well, in these days, you know, when you consider the ongoing pandemic concerns, the general unrest, general divisiveness that we're all subjected to, we seem to need that now more than ever. Uh And unfortunately, it seems that 
positivity has been kind of relegated to a side column in the newspaper, the last couple minutes of a newscast, Mm -hmm. and you're really putting it front and center. That's what it's all about. Yeah. And that's, and that's the thing we, it's, it's about reprogramming people. You know, and there's a show called, I call it the Ted Lasso effect. I don't know if anyone sees Ted Lasso, <laughs> sure. but Ted Lasso kind of throws people for a loop because he's this super positive, good energy human and all these people around him because we've been subjected, subjected by so much negativity. News wasn't like this 15 years ago. You know, it was now you turn on the news and it's just, it's about no matter what you can turn on at any time and it's like a death or a killing or this. And it's you, people don't realize the power of energy that you take in. So for just, and, and even if you go on Netflix, you see it's, there's all, you can't control that automatic play of that horror thing. Like, you know, my son's in the room and I turn it on. It's the last thing that I played, you know what I mean? And then it's, we're watching stranger, you know, whatever, whatever show we're watching and game of Thrones and, you know, you can't control this. So being in a place that like, we don't, we truly don't understand. uh, I mean, we do understand, but I mean, there's such a, a severe complexity to the energy that we take in. So even just from the simple images, we have it down to a science of just going, Our colors are vibrant. They make you feel good and they make you feel happy. So we're just looking down to a a deeper contextual level of just going like we are go and we we look at the creators we have and we dive deep into them and going, how are, what is the consistency of their content? What are they doing? How are they reflected out to the community? What is their mindsets? What are they doing? So we're really deep diving and curating that aspect of going, how are they going to impact our people? So let's go back for a minute to the the roots of Moco. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm I'm going to guess that even though the platform launched in late October, this is an idea that was percolating with you for a while. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Talk about the initial spark that started this and how you turned it into a reality. Yeah. So this has been a brainchild for about three years. You know, I came from uh, the corporate world. You know, I was in at all the Fortune 300 companies working at, you know, um, Cox Media Group and Home Depot and Coca-Cola and being a senior video producer there. And I started to see that the amount of money that was put into influencer marketing. And when I was there at that time, about three years ago, I just started seeing that going, wow, people are the ad spend and the partnership spend is anywhere. But, you know, some people were paying 24 million a month, you know, Cox media group was bringing about 20 million a month in combined money into uh, towards uh, partnerships with these influencers. And I'm going, wow. And this is only short form content and it's only for ads or it's integration or it's a post and social media posts. They start at 25 grand. You know what I mean? And like, and just, I don't know if you saw, like, um, there was, uh, this, it was called the squid games and Mr. Beast did this huge campaign and an ad for just a mid roll, a 10 second mid roll. I mean, they got their return because he's just on a whole other level, but they spent 2.4 million on a mid roll. So these brands are just so reliant on these influencers and they're throwing money at them and they don't truly know how they can monetize that. They're just going, okay, that's Mr. Beast or that's whoever. And we're going to throw 25 grand, a hundred grand, a million, just because they have a social media following. So, We really wanted to see, and then then the creators were going, no one's really monetizing the creators in a way that positively reflects them because they're on this cycle of going, okay, I need to post. I need to post every day and I need to do this. And they're subjected out into this world of commenting and negativity. That's one big thing that a lot of creators can't stand and because, and they can't control it because YouTube is a robot, you know, Instagram and all these other things, because they're so ginormous, they have no control. So that commenting, you can't shut that off. It takes you like a week or two weeks to even get rid of that. And then yet again, what I mentioned before is you're affected by that energy immediately. That one comment will throw you off. You see it in movies and stuff like that. It throws high suicide rates. It's just terrible for the consumer and other people to even pick that up as well as the creator. So when they're putting their whole efforts and energy into something and then they get that one comment when they're doing it for the people because you have those wolves out there. And you cannot help that. So we're protecting our people. So when I came with Mocha, I said, wow, why don't I create a place that's for creators, by creators, and then for consumers 
just going like with everything going on in the world, with all this negativity and COVID in our last two years have been just terrible. I mean, but we've been thriving. You know, you can, you just, you take it and then here's the thing, you just flip it. COVID, we go, hey, we've been, and these past two years have been really stressful, but it gives you an opportunity to slow down. And that's how MoCo was born because when we started it, we said, oh, COVID hit. We shut down originally. And then we lost a couple people on our crew. And then I just said, well, let's, let's repick this up because people need this. Well, it seems like such an admirable ideal, but I'm sure in the beginning there were some people who just didn't get it or didn't see how it could become a viable business. And with any business starting out, you have some initial people who aren't totally on board or are questioning it a little bit. How did you overcome that? (laughs) <laughs> well, we had a lot of things going against us because like I mentioned, you know, positive media, it doesn't buy because, <laughs> you know, you have the desperate housewives and you have all these other things that people want conflict. They want that energy. And it's, and, and the thing is, is actually in actuality, they don't, it's just been what they've been subjected to. So coming back to the Ted Lasso effect, he turns around, you know, I'm not giving away anything in the show for those of you that okay, haven't seen it, but it's just really like they come around because people really, truly, when you look at it, they want to be happy. So our, our battle, which we've had in the beginning with it is going, Thomas, all this positive, feel good content. People aren't used to this yet. And then also you're creating a paywall because what we did is I mandated a paywall so that we're contributing back. So I made it, I said in the world, we don't get back enough. You know, when we are given a choice, we won't give that extra dollar on that grocery lineup. We're going up to the line and we're like, oh man, I got to do this. Person's going to ask me for this damn dollar, (laughs) you know, and I'm going to have to do it or I'm not. But it's like, you're pressured. But, and, but the thing is, is like consciously, like with this business model is we want to, I wanted to create a mandate. So that's my two things against me. It's going, here's positive content. And then I'm creating, I'm that grocery store person saying you have to pay this daughter dollar essentially. I mean, you don't have the grocery store, but we're making it happen because we're able to, with $1, as little as that is a monthly, we're able to mm-hmm. contribute to causes that are going to be changing the planet in the world. So by you subscribing, you're making a difference. Well, and you you mentioned earlier positivity, and yeah, it's kind of a subjective term. I mean, in different people's minds, it's going to mean different things. How do you filter the content? I mean, obviously, you're taking in submissions from people. You're obviously going out and actively soliciting, you know, content from other people. What are the filters? I mean, how do you decide what content is proper for Stream Moco? Yeah. So my, my team is really high level. So my wife, who's my co-founder, she's a um, celebrity talent producer, also two-time Emmy award winner. Um, she is the, the level, the senior level of that curation, bringing that in. So, and we have a talent director, Anders group, who is from New York. So a lot of our people are remote. There's only a couple of people here in Atlanta, but we came from New York. So we hired a lot of um, the people that are really used to this talent recruitment. And so I built this culture and this, and this kind of demographic of going, this is what we're looking for. This is who we need. And this is what they need to fill. So they deep dive. So the two of them are just on a, on a hunt. And I approve a lot of it. Like if they have questions, they go through it. But like we, we launched with 26 shows and now we're at 60. Wow. So our growth is great, but they really know they're looking for that. It has to hit all those marks. It has to be really good quality. It has to have a, nar- uh, a narrative that connects. So an episodic feel and has to, and, and they have to deep dive into, and Ashley's a, a genius at um, deep diving into their history. So seeing we've had to deter, deter people away. Um, and I actually said no to Logan Paul um, because of, you know, some of the stuff that was on social media and certain things, you know what I mean? It, it wasn't MoCo, you know what I mean? So we're really defining this culture of like, you're MoCo or not MoCo. <laughs> That's great. No. And I think in the, in the early going, you can do that. I mean, you can set those guardrails, you can set those standards that are going to be part of the fabric of the organization going forward. Mm-hmm. So, for someone who isn't acquainted with it, I mean, these the content we're talking about, unlike Netflix documentaries that are long form, these are short form, right? These typically run how long? 
Yeah, they're um, they're ten minutes. Like some documentaries we have. So here's the thing too: is like we have our content's high level. Like it looks like Netflix, looks like HGTV. We have house flipping shows. We have a little bit of everything. So it it's it's very high quality. That's the other thing too. When you see that high quality footage or those shows on YouTube or HGTV, our stuff is that exact same. It's just short form. So we were in the space of like when we saw the failure of Quibi happen too. Is a great case study for us because they were onto something. You know, but the thing is, is they're about everything that they, their raise and their money, they were putting too much money out because they were getting celebrity talent rates. They weren't creating any pre existing content and they, and or they, it was all originals and they were paying for it. So they raised $2 billion and they're doing short form content because everyone is in this phase of short form consumption. So whether you're on a subway or anywhere, podcast, anything, they like that short form. You know, um, if I mean, and podcasts are different because I like podcasts longer. But it's just, it just depends. But I mean, for video consumption, the, the data is that it's short form. So that's what we kind of design that because we'll take documentaries. We just chop them up. So just a different, it's giving people an opportunity to not have to sit through an hour, you know, because when you watch these shows, Yellowstone or anything else, you're like committed for an hour. So we're us, we're breaking up 10 minutes. Well, and I suspect what may happen is even though somebody may come in planning to spend 10 minutes watching something they're going to get a certain feeling from that and they're going to watch another one and they're going to watch another one they spend may spend an hour or more yeah on the site just because it does have that feel good effect to it yeah and you've already had some really notable people uh post content on stream moco talk a little bit about some examples of the contributors you've had and the type of content somebody might see yeah so they're we're growing every day you know, and some of our um, two original shows because we I didn't I didn't plan to get into originals. So that was one of the cool things about our business model is with all the pre existing content, we're not paying anything for it. So I've designed this really cool business model to be able to get this content for free, but I do a shared revenue opportunity. So I'm giving a percentage of the subscription not only to the charities but also to these creators to enable and getting that. That's why our business model has been successful. Not Quibi throwing money out. So some of our great notable people uh, for our originals because they fell into my lap and I was like, oh man, we got to do these originals because so I ended up meeting and becoming friends with Beverly Mitchell's uh, manager. And so I was talking to him and she was telling, she was saying, oh, um, I want to do this cooking show. And so I was like, all right, I was on board. And then he was, he happened to be on speaker with Stephen Baldwin, who he also represents. So he represents the Baldwin family. And so Steven's like, what's this whole give back philanthropic thing, blah, blah, blah. He's like, I got a dog show I want to do. And he's like, <laughs> I want to do that. And I was like, all right, Steven. And then, and then I just got sucked in. So then I started to do, to do these two original shows. And they're excited because a lot of, and we just started acquiring all these celebrities like Billy Blanks Jr. And we have Marissa Pierce and we have a bunch of other great people. Um, and we're actually in talks right now with Mr. Beast and a bunch of other big name people that are coming in, which has been really, really, really fantastic because they're able to be them. That's the thing too, is like a lot of these celebrities are going, there's shows that they created Beverly and Steven and stuff like that. And Billy and everyone else, they're going, the word's spreading. And we're, we were only focusing on these influencer, like high level influencers, but now the celebrities are coming to us because they're going, Whoa, I can do a show that I want and I have full control. And we're going, yeah, you're a creator, you know? So these two shows that, you know, just for example, Stephen Baldwin's and Beverly's were their brainchilds. That's great. Well, and you've mentioned Mr. Beast a couple of times. And just for people who may not be aware, uh, the leading YouTuber in the United States and one of the huge philanthropists, especially with environmental causes mm -hmm. and what else can you tell us and about him? marketeer and money maker that ever existed? Like he's, you know, with his squid games, like I mentioned that, like that case study, like just looking at what he's turned around for people's profits to, I mean, he has one bill. I think he has like one or 2 billion views. Um, the amount of money that this kid makes and he's only 23. Um, they know a different business aspect and science to, a whole different marketing level. So that's, that's an exciting relationship that we're really passionate and subscribe uh, and, um, and, and developing there because every brand is tr just wants to be involved with him. So being able to be associated with him is, is going to be very beneficial for us. Well, you know, it's funny. I mean, people throw away this 
throw around this term influencer a lot. Mm -hmm. And it seems like anybody with a, a webcam and a ring light thinks they're an influencer. But I mean, you have really true influencers who are supportive and connected with Stream Moco who have huge followings before they even met you. Yeah. And, th and that's the thing too, is like, so that's a weird, it's, it's also another weird, weird thing. So influencers don't like being called influencers, the right. certain ones, because, <laughs> but it's the only way to identify who they are to audiences. Cause they're going, okay. Cause when you say a creator, they love to be called creators because the ones that we're dealing with are true. Not to say the other ones aren't, but they're true artists because they're filmmakers who, who are making this incredible content and they've either hired people they put their own money into it and they make this high level content that we're taking. That's the only stuff we're taking and nothing against the, I would call them the true influencers are the ones who are doing the makeup tutorial videos, the, the certain things they have the setups that is just literally talking to camera, you know, and, and those are, and it's nothing against them. It's just, they're only the, the only the capabilities that they have that are in front of them that they're using. Those are the influencers who are making big money. But our people have that narrative of follow series, drone shots in the sky. You know what I mean? Like true, like, like follow documentary type content. Well, and they have credibility they're walking in the door with. Mm -hmm. And they wouldn't have the followings they have if it wasn't for people trusting their authenticity, mm -hmm. their genuineness. And so as we talk about positivity I mean, there has to be a trust factor there where people say, this isn't window dressing. This is really coming from the heart. Mm -hmm. This is These are people who are really passionate and compassionate about what they're doing. And I think just coming in with that credibility already helps to build your platform's credibility as well. A hundred percent. You know, these the quality, like when you come to our platform and you look at our platform, like people are actually, it's funny, people are surprised. They go, whoa, this looks like Disney. And I'm like, well... That's because we have the Disney people behind it and the Twitter people and the Emmy award winners. And, you know, and so that's the cool thing is, is with these creators, we're giving that them that elevation too. So when they come over to us, we're not a YouTube, we're not an Instagram, we're not a social media platform. We're a beta version of the next Netflix. You know, that's what we're at right now. We're web based right now. We're scaling to getting into our app phase because we're getting into our next round. But when you go to our platform, we're a true I mean, I would say we most look like Disney right now, but yeah. Well, let's talk about your team a little bit. I mean, you mentioned your wife, Ashley, who is a part of it. Yeah. Um, but you've put together a real A-list of people working within Stream Moco who have some really exciting pedigrees and backgrounds. Yeah. Talk a little bit about your team. Well, first off. I don't know if I fully deserve them, but um, I guess I convinced them somehow to uh, come over to the dark side or the light side or the bright side. Um, but yeah, I first acquired um, Amy Emmerich, um, who was my old boss. So I came from Vice Media. I was a Vice Media producer and director way back in the day and um, early 2000s. And um uh, it sounds bad. It sounds weird. Like early 2000s is not way back in the day. Right. Um, you know, I should say the nineties, but no, I was still in high school. <laughs> um, sorry to date myself, but not because <laughs> I'm a young gun. Um, but yeah, so I acquired Amy Emmerich. So she was actually the vice president of vice, you know, huge distribution platform. And so I was just a peon little producer. And um, later on, she was one of the first people I pitched. And then she went on to, which was also owned by Vice, Vice uh, Refinery29, which is owned by, it's a female-centric platform, which is globally huge. So she was the global president of Refinery29. So when she left, she left there, um, I messaged her and said, hey, Amy, I got this really cool idea. What do you think? She goes, I'm intrigued, Thomas. So I harassed her for months. And then finally she's like, I love it. I love it. Let me be one of your advisors. So she came on as one of my advisors. And then through her, I acquired, um, Doug Yosem, um, who is, was the, uh, one of the hundredth employee at Twitter. He was working with the CEO of Twitter and he created, he was their CRM and he created ad integration. 
which was crazy. So he's, and now he's actually back at Twitter and he's the global head of events and production and, and content for Twitter. So he's also my other advisor. And then I have Kelly Summers, who's my CMO advisor and head of all my marketing. And she was responsible for taking um, Disney and making it go digital. Powerhouse. So, and then I got my wife and then I have our, another, our local Tom Cox, um, who everyone knows i everyone's actually kind of sad that I officially took him. He's off the market <laughs> and he's officially only Moco except for like special projects within Woodstock, but he is the brand genius. He came from Coca-Cola. He did the reformation logo. He's done everything. He's, I call it Tom town here. He's done the Alma coffee logo. He's literally done everything here. Um, maybe that in, in Woodstock one too. I mean, he's probably done it all. So just having him be the brains of, he's my, uh, CCO, uh, my creative, my chief creative officer. Um, and he's also a partner, um, who's come in. That's the only way I got him for free for two years. <laughs> I had to give him some equity. Um, and that's my team other than my talent director in New York, um, who he's on staff. And we actually have a young gun here, um, from Woodstock who is, I think he graduated from Etowah high school. Um, who is my editor. So he's uploading content. His name's Tommy Dickinson, um, a fellow local Woodstockian who's like been a crucial component of us of like, he was uploading every single video to our platform. And cause we're in beta phase, he had to do one video at a time. So he had two computers running. So thank you, Tommy, if you're listening, but yeah, so we have an incredible, awesome, amazing team. Well, and each one of them has such an interesting story of the things they've accomplished. And you have a pretty interesting story yourself. So let's, let's talk about your early career and kind of the events in your life that got you to where you are today. Yeah. Oh, and I totally forgot. I just got to say this really quickly. My finance guy. I totally forgot Brett, my guy who came aboard. I can't, I'm oh, sorry, that's Brett. That's going to be a problem. Brett, I love you. I love you. <laughs> Brett was my guy. He's my CFO. He's been in it with me in my first raise, everything. I'm sorry, Brett. You are my my other half. My other half, Brett. But anyways, yeah, his, his, his story is, that, yeah, I mean, he came from tech background and he owns a financial firm in Woodstock. I'm giving him the like crappy, like, <laughs> thank you. But Brett, please bear with me. But yeah, anyway, so, um, so yeah, me, my, <laughs> my background, um, you know, I'm originally Canadian and, um, and moved to the States because that's where the opportunity was, you know, and, um, married an American cause I had to, that's the only way I could stay here. And, um, and had a very fruitful career. I was in the space of, I was, I had a true coming up and true coming up age of story. You know, I, I started as a fashion photographer, you know, I went to New York city in in 2000 and right after I finished t film school in 2005 and I became a celebrity f uh, fashion photographer. I shot with Lady Gaga, Katy Perry. I have I won't, I'll spare you those stories because those are really long. You don't have <laughs> enough time for the podcast. But yeah, I've, I worked, I ended up getting into um, a really crazy scene. You know, I've, I partied with Lindsay Lohan, Heath Ledger. Um, I was there, you know, at the moments when Heath Ledger, right before he died, um, I was in the drug scene and I spiraled. And if you ever seen Basketball Diaries, um, that was me. I was actually... Uh, I lost my job. I was evicted from my house and I was a drug addict. And at night I was shooting photography and shooting shows and doing that. And, and during the day I was living in a bush in central park hmm. and that was two years of my life. And then, uh, no one knew I was homeless. My family didn't know I was homeless until, uh, my ex-girlfriend at the time she was living with, um, cause she was in transition. She was living with a woman by the name of Monica Knoll. And she ran a cancer organization and she, uh, she said, whatever happened to your ex-boyfriend? It's like, I was living in a bush in Central Park. <laughs> She's like, what? She's like, so they ended up, I was on, I was on a bender and I was just laying in a bush. And I just remember the last thing I woke up, I woke up in a bathroom, like basketball diaries, locked the door and heard a woman on the other door or on the other end and heard my ex-girlfriend. And I knew I was like somewhat safe and she cleaned me up. And she had a cancer organization called Cancer 101, and she rehabilitated me. And two weeks later, I got stage three testicular cancer. And it was a sign from the universe, from God, that just said, 
Thomas, you need to wake up. You're meant to do bigger things in your life. And I started volunteering for her, and she never had bigger sales ever, except for with me. She passed, and I got a tattoo of her in 2011. I was diagnosed in 2009, and it just completely flipped my wife, my life. I was, I'm looking back because actually my documentary about Ballsy is on my platform, and I'm looking at the old me, and I have this footage, just like crazy flash of the past, and just how superficial I was, and I'm not the same guy I am today. And we've, I've talked to you about about well, like Wayne Dyer. Wayne Dyer is a huge inspiration of mine. And just going, we're not in the same bodies from 10, 20, 30, 40. So when I look back at him, I'm going, I feel sorry for him. You know, but I don't live in the past. I live in the present because I'm going, I needed that growth. Because of all this, this is the man I am today and I wouldn't change anything. Well, and you know, people talk about those life events that change their life. And, you know, you'll hear people saying, well, you know, this is version 2.0 of me. I think I'm on version 10 or 11.0. <laughs> um, and, and most of us are, as you say, we go through those transitions and whether it's with experience, whether it's with age, whether it's with hardship or tragedy, um, it does change us. And one thing I love about your story is that You've always been one of those people that has taken the road less traveled. <laughs> and when you had your cancer diagnosis, and thank God you went into remission, but you decided, okay, I need to bring more awareness to testicular cancer patients. And tell us what you decided to do. <laughs> yeah. So I, you know, this is, like I said, dating myself, but it's, it's truly dating yourself in the technology space because back when I was diagnosed and I was doing this, I was an original, uh, influencer, you know, because in 2000, if you think about it, so 2009, Instagram wasn't created, Facebook just started. So this was, and it's weird to even think of that. So we're going, wow, you guys are a little bit older than me, but it's going like, wow, 2009 is nothing. Right. But it's like, you know, but in technology, that's a long time. So 2009, there was only YouTube really. So I just started putting myself out there. And like I mentioned too, it's like, uh, it was selfishly trying to go, Oh, cause I'm a documentarian. I'm going, wow, now I have my first documentary. I'm going to document <laughs> my whole cancer experience. You know what I mean? But that was also the way that I was dealing with my cancer. I didn't know how to do it any other way. Being 26 years old at the time, diagnosed with cancer, you only think that old people usually have it, you know, truthfully, you know, and then I learned that testicular cancer is in a young man's cancer. So it's between 15 and 35, you know? So I was like, whoa, this is a whole different world for me. And, and then as I started posting videos and stuff like that, I broke down the superficial guy because I started getting these videos and responses. Like it was funny back then, on YouTube, there's no emails connected. So like someone had to write in the comments and it's just was so weird. Cause yeah, it's just like communication. I saw a comment on one of my videos that said, wow, you changed my life. And I went to the doctor and got early detection cause I was feeling something and it saved his life. And then that moment I just cried for like hours and hours and hours. Cause I said, wow, this is a, a sign. My initials are TC, same as testicular cancer. And it was just this like signs that I was like, I have a bigger purpose to make a difference, to be a voice for men because there's so much stigma and the Superman complex that we need to be like tough and taking away our only thing that gives us power. You know what I mean? Our manhood um, is, is tough for young men. So being inspiring and being that they call me the, the legend in that in that space because in the cancer community, because I was one of the first um, men's health advocates in that. So. Well, in the campaign that you had, the cross-country campaign oh, yeah. to yeah. build awareness, and I mean, I know you were getting national TV exposure and a lot of press yeah. about the campaign because you did, what, how many miles? Pushed a giant testicle across two countries. <laughs> <laughs> Canada and U.S. Uh, Canada, I mean, yeah, they're both around, what is it, more than 3,000 Miles? Yeah, I think it was actually around 8,000. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> a, long, a, long, a long way. Well, and thank you. I mean, thank you for sharing your story. And 
you know, the fact that you're now doing Stream Moco, I mean, some people might say, oh, well, yeah, Thomas was always this positive guy and that was always a part of who he was. Not true, right? Exactly. I was the opposite. You know, I was, I was a hundred percent not positive. I was, you know, I was just so down on myself, you know, having a rough past and an upbringing and stuff like that. I was someone who didn't appreciate me or love myself is why I was going down this dark path. And I was, everything was superficial. So everything that I was doing, I wasn't doing it for me. I was doing it for other people to impress other people. So it wasn't coming from a, a positive place, you know, and then I was hard on myself. I was beating myself up over it. So the person I am today, like we mentioned, Wayne Dyer effect, you know, I'm completely different because now I'm going, I realize I'm like, whoa, all this testicular cancer stuff, all this ballsy stuff has given me now the power to create this platform of the two things that I love, storytelling and people and philanthropy and marrying them together is, is, is MoCo. So let's imagine that person that's, uh, you know, having a bad day, that person that's having a bad stretch right now Mm -hmm. and they go on stream moco. I mean, you've had a huge turnaround. I'm sure you're hoping that through the content on stream moco, it's going to help other people have that same turnaround in their feelings and their emotions and their self-worth. Yeah. I mean, it's the content that we're curating is, you know, it's inspirational. We have Kyle Cease, who's a a famous comedian and he, he's got a book and, his documentary is called the illusion of money and he's got an incredible doc series on our platform that can truly inspire you of just you know your self-worth and we have other documentaries on that that like that we have meditations we have um yoga we have a little bit of everything just things that you just want to even have mindless things that make you you know like steven show you know what i mean love steven show you know it's just and that's coming soon in january because we're just finished editing it but it's all about people and their passion and love for dogs You know, Beverly's is just being a real mom, you know, outside the celebrity aspect and the regular struggles. And it's comedic. It's fun. So we have things that are really lighthearted and and, and watching that aspect. But then there's a lot of takeaways. There's things where we have uh, we have a reality. um, We have like a um, a ex military EMC uh, cop that helps uh, people learn how to invest in real estate you know, other medics and certain people in those spaces. So there's a lot of takeaways, like I said. So these things where anything that you're coming to our platform, you're either going to, you're, you know, you're not going to cry in a bad way. You're going to cry in a good way because it's either going to transform your life or help you or make you laugh or make you feel good. So how often are you posting new content? Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's the thing that's just happening on a daily so the cool thing is, is we have episodes uploading new episodes from these series every day and we have new shows acquiring every week. So we've only been up. So here's the thing. We've just been up, um, a month now. And like I said, we launched with 26 shows. Now we have 60 and we have between eight and 10 episodes per those 60. That's a lot of content. And it's just growing every, every day we have sustainable farmers and how to, how to garden and how to do bouquets, you know, there's, but it's done in a, not a YouTube, like I said, like an influencer way, right in front of a, a camera. It's like really stylistically well shot. Um, great stuff. Now we talked about your team before and obviously having the, the right people in place is important, but it's also vital that you instill the right internal culture in a company. Now you just started a company Mm -hmm. and the easiest time to do that is usually when the company is first starting. You can really kind of decide what that internal culture is going to be. Describe the workplace culture for Stream Moco. Yes. Yes. Um, Yeah, I know you're going to love this part because I know you are all about culture. So that was the biggest thing that I found what I wanted to create within my ecosystem is that people love to work for MoCo. So I said, in every single role I wanted, I've talked to every single person. I said, what do you want to do? What do you actually want to do? And how do you want to grow? And where do you see yourself? And I sit down with them and I go, this is, what are your objectives? What are your goals? And I go, let's get there. And then I say within the culture, so I go, so I know that first and I go, what do you want to do? And they're like, oh, I want to be in the C-suite or I want to be a VP of this. And I'm going, great, love it. Let's work towards that. 
And then the, the culture I've just created is like, if, you know, Google had a baby with Patagonia, (laughs) so (laughs) just, um, just making it a loving environment where, you know, like if you have family issues and these things go to families first, go take care of that, go do that. You know what I mean? And then, cause I have someone right now who's going through some issues right now with, with her mother and just really going, do it. That's first. There's no hours. We don't have hours and we're going, it's just project based. As long as you're keeping your flow, we have our weekly meetings, accountability meetings like Elon Musk does just drills. Like here's my five minutes. What do you got for marketing? What do you got? This, 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 and then just staying on top of your game and being able to communicate, but going like saying you need to be hiking. You need to be outside. What do you love? Like figuring out like what they're passionate about and making sure that they're doing that, giving back philanthropy, going let's community service. Like, what are you doing there? Like everyone that we're bringing into, we're making sure that they're culturally fit for MoCo. We've had to get rid of people that culturally haven't fit. Well, and that and that's as important because that can also be contagious in eroding the culture if you have the wrong people in place that don't really fit. And, you know, you talk about aligning with people's goals and their ambitions. And I had somebody share their uh, culture goals with me not long ago, and I thought it was great. And what they said is, when these people retire and somebody were to ask them, at what point in time were you at your best? I want them to be to be able to say that it was when they were here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You yeah. know? That's my goal. I love that. Yeah. So we, we talked about MoCo being a subscription service. Yeah. Talk a little bit about the rate structure and how that works. Yeah, so it's funny. I was actually looking at an article um, um, this morning. <laughs> it was sent to me from Tom. And it was just about how subscription bases, subscriptions are really falling off. So, and we designed our subscription status because the Netflix and the Hulus and all these other ones, you know, the crazy thing is, is like my wife and I were talking this morning, we're going, okay, we're watching Yellowstone on Peacock. We're watching, you know, um, uh, who were we mentioning earlier? What's uh, Ted Lasso on Apple. You know what I mean? Then we have Netflix, Hulu. I mean, it's, everything's a write-off for us because it's our industry. <laughs> so all the streaming things are a write-off. By the end of the day, like these streaming costs go up and up and up and up. And we're looking at our bills and we're like spending 250 bucks a month on all of our stuff. And we're like, holy smokes. You know what I mean? It's like, let's go back to basic cable (laughs) or something or satellites cheaper. Right. You know what I mean? To get all these shows, but it's like, we're in the streaming world, but there's this interesting article that's saying that people are dropping off all the big ones, but they're looking for new ones. You know what I mean? So we're in this really cool sweet spot, you know, where we're not going to fluctuate our prices to the, to the height of, you know, uh, inaffordability. You know, so we're only three ninety nine, and then a dollar of that goes to um, the influencers, or sorry, the influencers. Uh, a percentage of that does go to the influencers, um, which we've allocated to. That's why we're getting our free content. But then twenty five percent, which my some of my investors I'm, think I'm crazy. Twenty five percent of my revenue is going towards these charities. So a dollar from every three ninety nine monthly subscription charge, a full dollar of that is going to charitable causes right away. Yeah. Circulating charities. So we, we, right now we have four charities. We have lonely whale, which is founded by Adrian Grenier. So we mentioned some big names, stuff like that. Um, Adrian Grenier is from entourage. She's a huge actor and stuff like that. He's a major human. He's a philanthropist. He's like one of my dream men, um, just what he does for the planet and everything. So, um, his organization's lonely whale. We're so fortunate to have him on board. And then we have Kiss the Ground, which is all about sustainability and and um, and and soil. So it's an amazing organization. There's actually a documentary on Netflix about it with Woody Harrelson and and all that. It's just it's this incredible documentary. So here I am promoting another platform, but it's like it's all about the environment. And it's like I'm fine with it. You know what I mean? Like check it out. Like and um, and uh, we have Rachel's Gift um, group, which is about um, children's loss. Um, my wife and I we actually lost our child. Uh, one of our, our, our daughter. And, um, so we support them. That's a, a personal organization that we support. And then we have, um, sh- the Sheldrick wildlife trust foundation, which is in Africa. And it's about supporting and protecting the elephants and the animals over there. So we're always, we're always bringing in new charities and stuff like that, but we're, we're leaving the opportunity for the consumer to pick the charity that they want to donate that dollar to. That's great. And I mean, was that part of the 
initial model? So it's funny, in, in the beginning, it wasn't um, because we, we started off as a free. We were starting off a free, and then we were going to be doing ads. But then I was like, everyone hates ads because then we started hitting the marketing team, and they're like, no, don't do ads, don't do ads. So we'll be down the road, we're going to get into like for revenue stream, you know, it's going to be subscription, but we will be doing ad integration. So you won't be seeing it. It's essentially a fancy word for product placement, you know? Um, so we'll be doing it that way. We'll never have ads, but there'll be brand integration and also social media partnership relations, which we can which is, mm -hmm. you know, we're bundling that up. Um, what, what was the question? Did I answer it? You did. Just if the, <laughs> if, the, if the charitable giving was part of the original model. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, yes, yes. So it wasn't in the original model, but then I said, circling back with Ballsy and everything like that, my testicular cancer and stuff, I'm like, gosh, like these amazing organizations we're working with, we have to create this mandate. I have to, because everything that I do, I always ask myself, is it Ballsy? Like when I, when I did that, first campaign of pushing those giant testicles across those countries. I got so much media. I was in over 260 um, uh, major media outlets from Cosmopolitan Magazine, everywhere, Men's Health, everywhere. They said if they put a logo on me, I would have been a, a whole uh, school did a case study on me. And they said for marketing wise, they said I was a social media genius because if I put a, a, um, a Nike logo on my ball, but they said I was a genius, but also a dummy. Because if I, if I had a Nike logo on my ball, I would have been able to get um, a $2 million evaluation based off that. So just a brand deal. Um, so yeah, so, so, so circling back from there, I just definitely said that I wanted to make a difference. And, and this was my ballsy effort going, hey, I'm going to create a paywall, 100%, but it's going to mandate that people donate. So my goal is in two to three years that I'm going to be donating, you know, if we really drive our subscribers at the, at, at, at the value that I'm looking at, my goal is between two to three years, I'll be giving away a hundred million. Good for you. That's great. So again, launched the end of October month or so ago. Mm -hmm. Um, biggest challenges right now. Oh boy. Um, biggest challenges right now. Um, like you said, with the ecosystem, you know, we dropped a key role. We lost one of our COOs due to culture. You know, and that was a big thing um, and, and an extreme vulnerability too. we we raised um, we did our first seed at 250,000 and then we did a full deal at 3.5 million, which was our next. And then due to cultural choices and stuff like that, we had to turn down the 3.5 million because um, it was not um, aligned and didn't work out. So our biggest challenge now is we have payroll <laughs> and Kelly was telling me last night for marketing. She's like, you're a true CEO, CEO right now. Like you have now your CEO and COO. So our biggest challenge right now is just, um, the cool thing is that we, we officially raised 3.5. So our valuations are, are in a good space, you know? Um, and we can, we can still sell that because we did a true, a true deal on it. And we just had to make that choice that it just wasn't the right fit for us. And so our valuations are really attractive so we're just going after that next raise right now. That's my biggest challenge. So actively looking for investors right now who want to get in on the ground floor of this. Yeah. It's like saying, here's Mark Zuckerberg in his living room in Woodstock <laughs> with all these powerhouses out there who want, if you had the chance to invest in Netflix at the beginning, call me. <laughs> <laughs> so those are the challenges. Let's, let's look to the future. Yeah. Uh, Talk about some of the goals and, and the future vision you have for Stream Moco. Yeah, so the goals, um, I don't want to get too emotional here, it's just like just that philanthropy aspect, like just being able to donate so much money and helping all these amazing charities out there will be just invaluable. You know what I mean? That's that's the goal. Like if I'm hitting that, if I'm getting close to that, like even – you know, in the hundred thousands of dollars that we'd be donating these charities, like that's a dream, you know, and being able to create this culture and this community. And like right now, it's so amazing that we're in this momentum of gaining content and it's coming to us and being able to just create this amazing culture grow. And, and the thing is too, is with the money growing to an app, you know what I mean? That's our next phase of like with that, with that million dollar, you know, in the million dollar raise, we need 250 K for just our app build because that's where we think too, is one of our biggest challenges right now. We're only web-based, you know, cause we're beta, but we really, with that, with that drive of getting more subscribers and that growth is truly being an app. 
You know what I mean? But yeah, I think like our, our foreseeable future is being an app, being everywhere on every single device possible and just being able to support all the communities, being able to uh, fund projects to help nonprofits. Nonprofits don't have the funds to be able to uh, produce content. You know, that's one way that what we're doing right now with uh, Lonely Whale and Kiss the Ground and all of them, we're going to be getting their content so that you can see episodic series of what organizations are doing. What are their stories? Even brands, brand stories, you know, in the extension of how did a brand company start? Like you, even your story, you know what I mean? Like giving an opportunity for a placement of like everyone has amazing stories and we're able to help support those and be a place for those. Well, and along the way, it seems like you're also giving a real visibility and platform to some of these creative artists out there that are building some of this content for you. And I mean, we had a conversation a few months ago with uh, Mike Levy, the co-owner of Mad Life. Oh, yes. yes and yes. about how Mike has such a, a real passion for developing artists mm. and helping to give them uh, a show place where they can really show what they can do. And it seems like yeah. you're doing that too with your documentarians and your videographers yeah. that are providing content. Yeah. And that's a story right there. You know what I mean? That's a show right there. And you know, and like with, with uh, Spencer from Reformation Brewery, like his growth there, that's a short mini series that you can do. And the thing is too, is like with all this content and stuff like that, it's, it's really exciting to be in this place because as a documentarian, I've been trying to make my documentary for seven years and now it has a home and all these amazing people who put all this time and money into these documentaries. And just because they don't fit the model of Netflix or Hulu, it'll never see the light of day other than YouTube. So for us to be able to support that community, we're that home for them. So before we finish up here, I want to ask you one question. I mean, obviously putting this all together, getting it launched took a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of commitment on your part based on your experiences what advice do you have for someone out there who's looking to transform their idea into a business for those new entrepreneurs out there? What advice would you share with them? <laughs> I, I love this thing. I love giving back um, truthful honesty and just and direction and, and just hopefully insight. Um, I had this one guy at the circuit that I ran into all the time and he came up to me. He's like, Thomas, how do you come up with your idea? And you do this and you raised money and you just did this. And I said, I sold me. It's all about you. I didn't do a business plan. I didn't do the traditional routes. I just did it. I started making movements. I sold my passion, my vision. And that's the thing that people invest in, you know, and that's the biggest advice I can do is just make movement. And this young guy at the circuit, he wanted to develop this app. And it was like this, I, I don't want to disclose what it is, but every time I saw him, I said, every time I see you, I need a new update. So it gave him a challenge. And every time I met him, he started making movements. Um, I haven't seen him in a bit, but hopefully I run into him soon around Woodstock because he's a Woodstock native. But just the biggest advice I could do is don't sit on something. You know, I originally started this idea and I put it down because I didn't think I could do it because I had someone who was running my sales and, and selling, the, selling um, Moco, which was positive TV at the time. And because he dropped off, I hung up the coat. And I let it sit for about almost a year. And then I didn't have value in myself and thinking that I could sell it. But every single deal I'm making right now and every single person and all these, all the money that we've gotten in, I've done it on my own, but not on my own with the support of the people around me. So that's my advice. Don't give up because you'll live in regret. And don't believe those messages you tell yourself because... You were wrong. Exactly. <laughs> it's a different part of your brain. It's the reptilian brain telling you in a subconscious level, like, this is scary. This is danger. And they even say, too, when you get to this point of success, all this negativity will start hitting you, all these challenges. And a lot of people, as soon as they get over that peak of that mountain, they give up, you know? And then that's the true aspect of once you get over that hump, there's always challenges in everything. So just as long as you keep driving and don't look back. Don't listen to any of that negativity. So let's give people a chance to get involved. If they want to uh, contact you about subscribing, about submitting content, about investing financially, yes. what's the best way to reach you? 
uh, investing, anything, I'll give you my phone number. Okay. <laughs> uh, you can check me out on LinkedIn. Um, everything stream out on all our streaming platforms. Uh, when you go, we just designed it. We just reamped our new landing page, which gives more information. It's at, uh, www.streammoco.com, double M. Um, and that has everything there, whether it's like submitting to content, we have a help email. There's also help, um, or talent at streammoco.com. You can email me at tcantley at streamoco.com personally. Um, I answer every email. I'm open to jumping on Zooms or anything, you know. I mean, only person that can't stand it is my wife because I'm on the phone all the day. <laughs> and you can register to be a subscriber right on the website. Yeah, yeah. So you can go on there right now, three ninety nine. You can pick your charity. I mentioned a bunch of the charities right now. You can start going. You can And even you can drop off at any time. You can do one month, and here's the thing. One month, you know, hey, you're at least contributing. <laughs> so. Well, Thomas, thank you so much for your time. I know how busy you are and for what I think is an inspirational story, both personally and professionally. Um, yeah, as we said earlier, it seems certain that we all could use more positivity right now. And Stream Moco is the place to get it. We wish you and your entire team continued success. This next chapter is going to be a great one for you. And obviously, best wishes for the holiday season. So thank you very much for being here. Pleasure being here. And we thank you for listening to Woodstock Proud. We hope you enjoyed getting to know our guest, Thomas Cantley, a little bit better. Until next time, this is Jim Bulger saying take good care of yourself. Please stay safe, and we will talk with you again real soon. (laughs) 